Hi, and welcome to our webinar on structuring hybrid office-based laboratories and surgery centers in compliance with fraud and abuse laws. We want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, there has been increasing growth and interest in structuring ASC OBLs in compliance with the law for a number of reasons lately, uh, mainly as a result of CMS's ongoing push for site neutrality and to move uh, cases and to move surgeries into the lowest cost as well as the most efficient uh, setting where services can be uh, safely provided. As a result, there's been a lot of interest in, in developing these types of ASC OBL models, as well as some recent changes to the law that uh, one of our presenters, Jan Dees, will discuss in which uh, PCI looks to be uh, able to be performed in an ASC setting coming up. But what we'll do today, just to uh, get some of the housekeeping out of the way, is the presentation should take about 45 minutes to go through, and then we'll open it up to questions at the end. If you have questions, please feel free to send us them. There's a Q&A button at the bottom, and we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Jan Dees, who's the CEO of American Vascular Associates, uh, which has been established for over 11 years. AVA has 12 centers in eight states, and they're currently building five hybrid labs through the U.S. Jan's a board member of the Cardiovascular Coalition and works with the lobbying efforts in Washington, D.C., promoting PAD advocacy and expansion of procedures for diagnostic and interventional cardiology in the ASC setting. She's also a frequent speaker with NCVH as well as with us. Uh, I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Jake Selick, whose practice focuses on healthcare law and encompasses a range of regulatory, transactional, and corporate matters. Uh, his work includes counseling clients with regards to legal aspects of day-to-day -day operations, including general corporate matters, the anti-kickback statutes, stark self-referral issues, corporate practice of medicine, uh, HIPAA, and licensure requirements. And, uh, my name is Jason Grace. I'm a partner with McGuire Woods in our Chicago healthcare office. Uh, I've been practicing for about 15 years. I focus primarily on dialysis and nephrology, vascular access, OBLs, ASCs, hybrids, and uh, a number of other different types of providers. Um, in my shameless plug to you, I'll also tell you briefly about some other upcoming webinars and events that we have coming up. We have our healthcare and finance growth conference on Tuesday. Well, we already had that one. Our practice succession planning and wind down strategy um, on Wednesday, October 9th. We've got another webinar discussing strategies for unwinding practice acquisitions and strategic ventures on Wednesday, November 13th. We have another webinar in the series entitled Valuing Ancillary Physician Businesses on Wednesday, December 11th. And we have our uh, primary healthcare conference, uh, healthcare and life sciences private equity conference in Chicago at the Ritz-Carlton on February 19th and 20th, which is a great conference, and hope you can attend if you're willing to brave Chicago in February. Uh, so with that said, we will just uh, briefly go through the agenda. What we hope to cover today are the business benefits and the, the reasons to consider an OBL-ASC hybrid. We'll talk about ensuring compliance with federal fraud and abuse uh, safe harbors and exceptions, primarily focusing on anti-kickback and Stark as they apply to the development of OBLs and ASCs and the ownership in OBLs and ASCs. And then at the end, we'll give you some key business legal takeaways and considerations when uh, developing or structuring an OBL-ASC hybrid. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jan. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jason and Jake, for allowing me this opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm very excited about this, and uh, what we'd like to talk about is why the hybrid model is the way to go. Um, we also will look at the PAD reimbursement and the proposed reimbursement for 2020. That has, CMS has uh, released the proposed rules. Uh, we'll also talk about the additional coronary procedures that are proposed and open for comment for 2020 for the ASC. 
and also about the uh, Cardiovascular Coalition and other organizations that are organizing letter writing campaigns and calls to action for in support of these additional procedures to be able to be done in the ASC. What you'll be seeing here is the CMS proposed PAD site of service comparison and looking at what the difference is in the reimbursement in the office-based lab versus the ASC. These are for PAD codes. Um, even with the decreases that are proposed for 2020 for the office-based lab and there's still some discussion going on, uh, it still remains anywhere from $4,000 to uh, $2,000 higher to do the to do the o to do the PAD procedures in the office-based lab, and that's going to tie into our discussion of uh, why the hybrid. Um, in addition to this, you'll be seeing in the next slide the um, the proposed new codes that CMS has um, already identified as being approved for 2020. In addition to three add-on codes. And this is the 2020 ASC global rate. That is, so that will be combining the technical and the professional. Um, and then th this is very exciting because we've been thinking that this was going to happen for the last two years. And now we do have these codes with three add-on codes that have been approved. Uh, and there's an additional set of 12 codes that are, have been identified for, and open for comment. What I do want to also talk about, which will be the next slide, is the barriers to doing PCI in the ASC. Uh, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of excitement. We're, we're definitely seeing the train of where CMS would like to see these procedures being done. Um, but there's also state-by-state -state laws and regulations, even though CMS approves a code does not mean that each state will allow it, and those are the barriers that I want to make sure that everyone does understand. Um, there's, there's definitely governing bodies in each state, the Board of Health, the Board of Medicine, and CON laws, which Jason and Jake will be talking about in more detail. But those laws prevail and that they also have to be taken into account for the opportunity to do a hybrid and to do PCI in the ASC. Some states, and we will show you in the next slide, a map of states that will and will not allow coronary procedures in the ASC setting. Uh, there is also some movement in states where we're opening in two states that are currently reevaluating their position on this, the Board of Medicine, and we may see a turnaround. But at the same time, just so that clients and physicians are aware, so you don't want to get into developing a project only to find out that your state is not going to allow it to be done. Um, also, the CO law and laws will prevail and will add additional time and expense to the process for the facility and to be able to do PCI procedures in, in the ASC. So that we continue to recommend building a new center as an ASC to ASC standards opening as an OBL because, as you saw in the previous slide, the reimbursement continues to be more favorable in the OBL for doing PAD procedures, and then going through the process of being credentialed as an ASC, and if you have to go through the CON process, of being able to be open but with the intent of, once you are approved, of moving ahead. Uh, what we have included here is a state-by-state -state, um, check uh, in terms of your CON laws, and again, Jake and um, Jason will be talking more about that. Um, in this next slide, is this, these are the states currently where PCI is allowed in ASC is in the blue states. So that you can see, it's about 50%. And this is, again, where we, we're cautionary and making sure that as we approach each project that we know what the 
state laws are, we know the Board of Medicine laws, and we're aware of where or where we may not have an issue, but we also want to be understanding that we have to comply with those state boards of health, board of medicine, and CON. Um, in addition to that, this is where we also show where PAD is allowed in the OBL is in all states, so that uh, depending upon the timing and the interest and the level of interest in doing PCI in the ASC, that you know you can do PAD, and it, then we can, then you can work with your individual groups of physicians and your clients to determine when and at, at what point will PCI be able to be done. Um, here in Florida, we are able to, that there is not an issue, and we have hybrids that have been open now for three years. Um, but however, we're in several other states as well. Um, in the next slide, I wanted to also be an advocate for the Cardiovascular Coalition. Uh, this is one of the voices that is addressing advocacy, uh, supporting the codes, and have now embarked on letter writing campaigns with uh, not only the OEIS organization, um, but also with the other specialties in, in promoting PAD advocacy, uh, patient education, awareness, and working together. Uh, also of note is that September is the PAD Awareness Month and that there's a lot of information available on this website for your patients, your staff, your clients, and it continues to be updated weekly, and this is a big month for PAD awareness. And with that, I will turn this over to Jake. All right, thanks, Jan. Um, so as Jan mentioned, there's, there's quite a few um, state laws that need to be carefully looked at in connection with um, a hybrid OBL ASC model or a standalone OBL model or ASC model. Um, but what Jason and I are going to focus on here is kind of the primary drivers of the regulatory analysis for um, establishing an OBL or an ASC or a hybrid, which is the federal anti-kickback statute and the Stark Law, um, which applies to um, physicians who make referrals to entities in which they have a financial relationship. And with respect to the latter, Jason's going to focus on that at the end of the presentation. Um, what I'm going to focus on um, is the federal anti-kickback statute, which is, again, one of those primary laws that need to be looked at and analyzed before, you know, taking the next step in, the, in evaluating whether the arrangement can be um, done in compliance with, with applicable laws. So just as a general overview, the anti-kickback statute is a criminal statute, um, and it prohibits the knowing and willful offer payment solicitation or receipt of any remuneration of any kind um, overtly or covertly. And so these are things that are given in exchange for referrals of item, items or services, um, in exchange for ordering or purchasing items or services, or in exchange for arranging for the referral, order, or purchase of any item or service um, that involves a federal health care program beneficiary. So we've got the definition kind of of what a federal health care program encompasses um, on the slide here. The short answer is pretty much everything. If it can be tied back to a federal, to a government-run health care program, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE, the Department of Labor Workers' Compensation Program, anything, um, operate under the assumption that it falls within the scope of the anti-kickback statute. Um, and what we're going to focus on today, and we'll kind of touch on this point throughout um, the discussion on the anti-kickback statute is really what the uh, ownership, um, the ownership of an OBL or an ASC does in connection with the analysis here. So, um, as I mentioned, a very broad statute. Who does it apply to? Short answer: everyone. Um, it applies to physicians and healthcare providers, but also any other individual or entity. It applies to management, comp management companies. It applies to non-physician investors. So, um, again, the name of the game here, it's extremely broad and applies to everyone, unlike Stark, which Jason will talk about, which applies specifically to physicians. Um, what are the penalties? 
so it's important to kind of know why is this important and why are we taking this, um, it, you know, putting this on a pedestal in terms of our analysis and a pillar of our analysis. And that's because the penalties under the anti-kickback statute can be very severe. Um, the fines can be up to $100,000, including imprisonment. Um, include, in addition to that, there's civil monetary penalties that can be imposed for $100,000 for each violation, um, plus damages up to three times the total amount of any remuneration um, that was received in violation of the statute. And then there's also kind of the quote-unquote death penalty um, where providers can be excluded from participating in federal health care programs um, for a period of 10 years. And then one thing that's not on the statute, but or, I'm sorry, that's not on the slide, but that is provided for in the statute is the potential for False Claims Act liability, which really can ramp up the, the penalties involved that, that's associated with treble damages for each each claim that's submitted. And the unique thing about the False Claims Act is it permits whistleblower actions. Um, so if you have a disgruntled former employee or someone who finds out about an arrangement that is uh, potentially unlawful, they can bring a False Claims Act action on behalf of the government based upon a violation of the anti-kickback statute. Um, so the name of the game under the anti-kickback statute, which you'll hear attorneys talk about very frequently, is fair market value. And in the context of ownership interest, that's typically um, an issue that's addressed at, at the time someone buys into an entity or buys out of an entity. Um, you have to ensure that they're buying in or buying out at fair market value. So what does that mean? Um, in short, it means that the value in an arm's length transaction consistent with general market value. So what would unrelated parties that had no financial interest in one another um, bargain for is essentially the short answer. Um, it can't be determined in any manner that takes into account the volume or value of, of referrals and importantly, that includes past referrals. So what happened in the past does matter. You can't, um, you can't say, well, I wasn't rewarding somebody for referrals in the past, so therefore I can allow them to buy into my entity for less than fair market value um, without worrying because that can be construed by the government as a reward for those past referrals. Um, and then we've just got an example here of where fair market value is important. You know, this is an example of a dialysis provider that leases space from a nephrologist who's in a position to refer patients to the dialysis provider. Um, if that rent is above fair market value, it can easily be argued that, <coughs> that that inconsistency with fair market value is done to induce referrals to the dialysis provider. And the, the fair market value is typically done in the context of rent, for example, based on comparables. We like to tell clients kind of the gold standard is obtain a third party valuation um, and that can be done for any sort of arrangement. It can be done for a medical director agreement. It can be done for um, the, the value of a buy-in or a buy-out um, scenario. <coughs> I apologize. I'm getting over a cold. Um, <coughs> so moving on from fair market value, you know, what types of remuneration are there? Um, and we've got a list here. The most important one that we're focusing on today is investment income and rewarding owners of an OBL or an ASC um, in the form of remuneration that, that in, with remuneration that comes in the form of investment income and the ability to generate profit distributions from the entity. Um, and so the, in this context, the world is kind of broken down between interventionalists who are capable of performing procedures at the facility and non-interventionalists or what we refer to as passive investors who refer to the facility but do not actually perform services and provide patient care at the, at the ASC or at the OBL. And in, that's kind of the broad statement, but really to drill down on that and to assess the specific risk that would apply to your situation is an extremely fact-specific analysis um, we would need to understand very specifically who the owners are, what the referral patterns are, what the capabilities of the owners are in terms of being, a, being able to provide services at the facility. And I'll get into kind of why that's important when we talk about the safe harbors um, to the anti-kickback statute a little bit later because that really will clarify why the government views um, the ability to perform services at the ASC or the OBL as an integral part of the analysis. But um, 
in, in short, each situation is going to be a lot different. For example, if you have a OBL that's owned by all non-interventionalists who simply make referrals to the OBL and don't actually perform services there, that could increase the risk profile, but at the same time, if it's done as an extension of, the, of a group practice, that might decrease the risk profile. And Jason will kind of break that down a little bit more um, later. But in short, you know, it's very important to look at the investment income that's derived from an OBL or an ASC as it relates to and a kickback statute risk on a fact-specific fact basis based upon the makeup of the ownership. Um, next, you know, so here are some examples of prohibited remuneration that actually resulted in extremely large dollar value fines and penalties. Um, you know, these things range from, in the first example involving um, DeVita, you know, redeeming a physician joint venture partner at inflated prices, um, to induce for the referral of patients to its clinics. That's a, you can see, $350 million. Um, moving down, there's a couple marketing and advertising situations where physicians were given free marketing and advertising in, in exchange for referrals. And then the last one here um, dealt with paying compensation to physicians in the form of a sham management arrangement where the services provided were not commensurate with the, the payments under the management arrangement. Um, resulted in, a, in an anti-kickback statute prosecution and a significant fine. And another thing, and this didn't happen in all these cases, but another thing to keep in mind is we actually, there are examples out there of physicians actually going to jail as a result of violating the anti-kickback statute. So this isn't some pie-in-the-sky thing that never happens. It does happen. It obviously depends upon the egregiousness of the conduct, but we do see it. So it's important to be aware of that. And Another thing takeaway from this slide, I think, is once you, it's very important to cross your T's and dot the I's up front before you commence operations and sort of let the horse out of the barn, because once things kind of go sideways and you're under investigation, it's extremely difficult to right the ship at that point, and um, you know you're likely looking at it either a significant repayment to the government or potentially even a prosecution. Um, so, I've kind of touched on a lot of these things that I've been talking so far, but um, these are the types of arrangements that in the ASC OBL world that could implicate the anti-kickback statute. So, like I've mentioned, investment in the ASC OBL, that's kind of the focus of today. Um, management agreements, equipment leases, space leases, personnel leases, uh, medical director agreements, any other type of personal services agreement and then even consulting agreements if there's a physician who stands to gain financially from the arrangement. Uh, so shifting gears a bit, what can we do to protect ourselves against the arrangement now that I've you know, explained all of the pitfalls associated with violating the anti-kickback statute? Fortunately, there is some degree of guidance out there for what we can do to comply, and this is the type of analysis we go through all the time with our clients. Um, so there are statutory exceptions to liability under the anti-kickback statute that Congress has enacted, and then there are also safe harbors that have been promulgated by the HHS Office of Inspector General, um, which, if complied with 100%, will immunize that arrangement from liability under the anti-kickback statute. Not necessarily prosecution, but liability. So ultimately, if you can establish that you've complied with each element of an applicable safe harbor, then you are immunized from liability under the anti-kickback statute. These are designed to permit legitimate arrangements in the healthcare space that um, involve remuneration flowing back and forth from referral sources to providers um, without in encompassing them within the scope of the anti-kickback statute. So the first safe harbor I'll touch on is the small investment company safe harbor that's typically used um, or looked to with respect to structuring an OBL. Um, and so with, the, with that safe, there's, there's a few other requirements that I'll focus on in the next slide, but the key elements of in small investment safe harbor are here on the screen. First, no more than 40% of the investment interest in the entity can be owned by investors or in a position to refer or influence referrals to the entity or otherwise generate business for the entity. And secondly, no more than 40% of the gross revenue of the company 
can come from referrals or business generated by investors with an ownership interest. So you might be looking at that and thinking, well, we're screwed. And um, there are a lot of OBLs out there who can't meet that test. And one thing to stress when we're talking about the anti-kickback statute is it is an intent-based statute, um, unlike the Stark Act, which Jason's going to talk about. And what that means is that even if you don't comply with all of the elements of the safe harbor, that doesn't necessarily make the arrangement illegal because, again, safe harbors are used to immunize an arrangement, not necessarily to ensure that there is no liability under the under – the, I'm sorry, to ensure that um, you're not violating the statute. You cannot violate the statute by simply acting in a manner that it does not demonstrate an intent to offer remuneration in exchange for referrals. And so that's the point that we've put finally on this slide is that, you know, even if your referring physicians aren't satisfying the 40% standard, if we can structure the arrangement to comply with all of the other elements of this safe harbor, it does tend to mitigate the risk. It doesn't eliminate the risk by any means, but it can drive down your risk profile. And again, this is an extremely fact-specific analysis, so this, that's not intended to be a blanket statement. But if we go to the next slide, we can see some of the other elements of the small investment safe harbor that you know are um, that can reasonably be complied with in the context of an OBL. So the purchase price is offered to referral sources in a manner that's exactly the same as non-referral sources um, and is consistent with fair market value. It's not tied to the past or expected future referrals. There's no loans being made from the company to referral sources to furnish you know that could be seen as inducing. Um, the, the inducing referrals for items or services to the business. The company's not guaranteeing loans on behalf of referral sources. And then profit distributions to investors are proportionate to the investor's capital investment in the entity. So these are things that, you know, can fairly easily be done to in, and included within your, your corporate structure and the way you operate the business that will, again, tend to drive down the risk profile, even if all of the safe harbor elements can't be met. Okay, so shifting gears, let's talk about ASCs for a minute. So there is an ASC safe harbor under the anti-kickback statute that specifically is, is dedicated to ASCs and investment interest in ASCs. Here are the, kind of the general requirements. So these are similar to the ones we looked at on the last slide for OBLs that we think, you know, we can, we can do this. We can get there with a lot of these things in terms of, you know, investments not tied to volume or value referrals. There's no loans or guarantees offered to investors. There's no distributions that are made inconsistent with the invest investor's um, capital investment in the entity. Ancillary services are integrally, integrally related to primary procedures performed at the ASC and not separately billed. Um, all patients are treated in a non-discriminatory manner, and they're fully informed of the physician's ownership. So those are requirements in the ASC Safe Harbor that we think we can, you know, that a lot of organizations are going to be able to meet. The next one is the key element, however, and that's what we refer to as the one-third tests. And so the ASC Safe Harbor provides that in order to fully satisfy the Safe Harbor, at least one-third of each physician investor's medical practice income from all sources must be derived from the physician investor's performance of ASC procedures. And then for multi-specialty ASCs, it's that test, plus there's an additional test, that requires that one-third of the ASC procedures performed by each physician investor uh, must be performed through the ASC. So the OIG implemented this requirement under the ASC Safe Harbor um, for purposes of addressing their chief concern with ASC joint ventures between physicians and management companies or non-physicians. And specifically, they were trying to address situations where the, J the joint ventures um, may use, you know, may use investment opportunities in the ASC as, a, as an avenue to reward non-interventionalist physicians for referring patients to the entity. So again, we've got the quote-unquote passive investor who is permitted to, you know, take profit distributions from the entity that they can influence what those profit distributions are by making referrals to the entity, but they don't actually provide patient care services there. So that's the concern that they're trying to address here. And similar to the 40% requirement in the, person, or in the small investment safe harbor, 
a lot of you know a lot of our clients aren't able to satisfy this test, and the, uh, we won't get into the details here. The risk profile of not meeting this test does tend to be a little bit different than not meeting the 40% test, just because of the way that um, you know the, the safe harbor is looked at around the country with respect to all sorts of different providers. Um, so you know this is again a fact-specific analysis as to what it means for your organization if you can't meet this element in terms of how it affects the overall risk profile of, of investing in an ASC um, as a non-interventionalist. And then you know we we're trying to focus today on investment income um, more so than other relationships, but we wanted to put. Um, these other safe harbor there are other safe harbors that are available, including for leases as well as personal services agreements. Um, and this is, slide has kind of an overview of what those safe harbors there. So just to make the point that um, remuneration flowing between a, a personal services arrangement or a lease between referral sources and an entity providing the services, those can be protected by a safe harbor as well. You just would have to work through that analysis. So what are the kind of overall takeaways? So the AKS is an extremely broad statute. That's number one. It applies to virtually everyone. Um, and even a legitimate arrangement can be tainted if a single purpose of that arrangement is to induce referral. So you could have, you know, all the reasons under the sun why this arrangement is great for patient care, you know, um, it's, it supports the community, it's important to, to deliver those services to patients, but if one purpose is also to induce referrals by, a, by providing some form of remuneration, then that can taint the entire arrangement. So it's important to look at kind of all angles. Um, state law, most states have parallel, federal anti parallel statutes to the federal anti-kickback statute. Um, typically, compliance with the federal anti-kickback statute will really ratchet down any risk under those, but those need to be looked at as well. Um, and then finally, like I said, the name of the game, fair market value, you know, all, we always hammer that, and that's something that should always be in the back of your mind because that ultimately is the number one thing that can protect you against an anti-kickback statute uh, prosecution. So with that, I'm going to shift it to Jason, who's going to talk about the Stark Law. Thanks, Jake. So these are complementary laws. You can find yourself in violation of Stark but not AKS, AKS but not Stark, but oftentimes violations of one will mean a violation of the other. And whereas our clients are oftentimes frustrated by an analysis under the anti-kickback statute, because if you ask an attorney, I guarantee you nine times out of ten, the answer is going to be it depends. And as Jake drove home under the anti-kickback st statute, the analysis is incredibly fact-dependent um, on whether or not there's an impermissible intent to induce referrals. With Stark, the analysis is more clear-cut. It is a strict liability statute. Stark prohibits a physician from referring a Medicare or Medicaid patient for the furnishing of designated health services, or DHS, to an entity with which a physician or immediate family member has a direct or indirect financial relationship. And the answers there are, are clear-cut. You're either violating Stark or you're not. The good thing is, in the context of ASC ownership, for the most part, Stark law is not implicated um, because in, when you have an ownership and interest in an ASC, these services are generally reimbursed pursuant to a bundled rate, and bundled rates such as ASCs and dialysis services are generally not considered Stark law designated health services. However, Stark does play a significant role when structuring an OBL, and we'll get into how that comes to be. Um, so I'm going to spend some time, well, before we get there, so the, the penalties for Stark are generally civil in nature and can be significant because of the potential for treble or triple damages for every claim uh, that was improperly submitted and reimbursed by federal governmental payers because there is a link between Stark and the False Claims Act, and the False Claims Act allows for triple damages. Um, the FCA incentivizes whistleblowers, as Jake mentioned, to report fraud by offering them a percentage of any reward covered by a lawsuit, and that percentage is generally uh, in the range of about 15 to 25 percent. 
And in every key TAM action, uh, the government has the option to either step in and litigate or decline the case. As Jake also mentioned, and I'll drive home again, there are lots of people who can be a key TAM realtor, but the two that are the most common, or three that are the most common, are upset and former disgruntled employees, competitors in the area that are looking around and saying, hey, I don't think that this person's doing it the right way. And, uh, you know, hospitals, health systems are payers. You know, and I think that they fall into that category of either being economic competitors or maybe having some concern that you're not doing it the right way. So you know, it doesn't take a lot to pick up uh, the phone and, and make an anonymous tip sometimes. So you just never know, and you have to be on the lookout for those key TAM cases. So I'm going to spend some time on this slide. So typically when working with clients to set up an OVL, again, keeping in mind that Stark's typically not involved in ASC setups, one of the first questions that I typically ask is whether a client intends to structure an OBL as part of their physician group practice or as a standalone separate POS 11 entity. And the reason being is there are benefits and drawbacks to each structure, and it's important to know up front how, a, how a, uh, a party wants to structure it. For example, some of the key benefits of setting up an OBL within a physician group practice includes that if you're buying into a physician group practice, there's typically not a requirement that you have to buy in in exchange for fair market value. Whereas if you set up an OBL as a separate entity outside of the practice, there is a fair market value buy-in requirement. If you set it up within the practice, an OBL can oftentimes be organized more quickly. Uh, you don't have to go out and get new payer contracts, new tax IDs, new, co you know, new equipment, et cetera. Likely the practice has some or all of that um, already. Uh, and then a key question that comes up under Stark is if you're going to set up uh, an OBL within a practice, you may be able to perform a full range of OBL services, including designated health services, within the group practice if, it's, if that arrangement and if those services are provided in compliance with the Stark Law in-office ancillary services exception. And this slide talks about what is re those requirements are to satisfy the in-office ancillary services exception. Whereas if you provide, if you set up an entity outside of a group practice as a separate POS 11 OBL entity, more likely than not, that entity will not be able to satisfy the IOAS exception. The reason being is that one of the requirements for the IOAS exception is you have to be a group practice. And when folks come together oftentimes to set up a separate OBL entity, that entity oftentimes won't qualify for a group practice, and we'll get into the reason why in, in just a minute. One of the drawbacks, however, of setting up a, an OBL within the physician group practice is the lack of potential syndication opportunity and of the, the inability to create a saleable entity down the road. So again, one of the first questions I'll ask folks is, is this a long-term hold? Is it intended to be part of your physician practice as an extension of your physician group practice? Or are you looking at some point down the line to create an entity that you're looking to sell? And those are the, the, really the decisional drivers in terms of, you know, do you want to sell this? Do you want to hold this? Do you want to perform all services? Are you okay with maybe not performing Stark Law services? And those are some initial questions to discuss with your attorney, with your management company, with whoever, with your development company when you're setting these things up because all of those things can really radically impact your pro forma and your financial return on investment. So as I mentioned, if you're setting up a, an OBL outside of your physician group practice, it's difficult, if not sometimes impossible, to meet the definition of a group practice in that separate entity. And if you can't meet the definition of a group practice, you can't satisfy the in-office ancillary services exception, and you can't provide designated health services in that entity. So what does that mean if you're setting up a separate entity? It typically means that those designated health services need to be provided within the context of a physician group practice. Again, if you provide DHS services, Stark Law DHS services in an entity that's outside of your physician group practice, other than in compliance with a Stark Law exception, it's a violation. This one, you know, like I said, on like anti-kickback, 
This one is is clear cut. So um, it, it either is, is going to work or or it's not. Um, again, you know that's kind of the name of the game in terms of structuring for compliance with you know, an OBL in compliance with the IOAS exception, making sure that you can either perform or not perform Stark Law designated health services in an OBL. Like under the anti-kickback statute, there, you know, where there are safe harbor for leases, under the Stark Law there are quote unquote exceptions that tend to in many ways mirror the safe harbors under the anti-kickback statute. Again, here the key is going to be fair market value. Rem you know, we always recommend, as Jake said, obtaining a valuation from an independent qualified appraisal company to make sure that fair market value is being paid. We never want to give, you know, someone the argument that either the rent is above market or below market as an intent to induce or reward past or future referrals to an entity. Um, these, ex they're also. It, similar types of exceptions for space, equipment, and personnel leases, uh, as well, you know, to to protect to guard against some of the fraud and abuse risk. And the same rules apply for personal services provided to an ASC or OBL. Uh, professional services agreement with an OBL or ASC should also be structured structured consistent with fair market value. Um, the financial arrangement should be set in advance and in writing and have a term of at least one year. So what does this mean for common ASC and OBL professional service arrangements? A couple of questions that we get a lot. One of the, the main ones is, can I pay the practice that provides services to my OBL a percentage of net collections? So generally the answer is yes. You know, the, so long as a percentage is consistent with fair market value, percentage-based arrangements to an entity providing services to an OBL are going to be permissible. Now let's take that same question and can I pay the practice that provides professional services to my ASC a percentage of net collections? This is a more nuanced question, quite frankly. A percentage of or all of the professional fee is generally probably permissible, but a question that we oftentimes get is, well, can I also pay the practice a percentage or a portion of the technical component um, and our general answer is that sort of arrangement can implicate kickback concerns because only the owners in the ASC should be sharing in the technical component of the payment, uh, not the service providers. So one of the most common complaints um, that we hear from physicians after we go through our analysis is hey, you know what, I don't understand our competitors doing it this way and we really want to do it the same way. And, you know, when we delve more deeply into how an arrangement's been structured and when we explain why the arrangement can pose risk, you know, folks typically say, well, why are they doing it that way? And unfortunately, I don't, oftentimes don't have good answers and sometimes it's an issue of greed or ignorance or maybe receiving some, some questionable advice or guidance. But there are plenty of risky ownership structures and service arrangements out there, and we often you know, tell our clients that given the criminal and civil risks and the penalties and potential loss of licensure and Medicare participation, you know, the risks can be significant. And so what this slide is intended to drive home is that the government's out there, key TAM realtors are out there, there's a lot of enforcement out there. It used to be that for every dollar that the government would spend on enforcement, it would be an 11 to 1 return on investment, you know, much better than the stock market. Now the return on investment has gone down to about 6 or $7 to 1, but it's not because there's less enforcement, it's actually because they've dedicated more resources to enforcement. They have hired a lot more people, they have invested in technology to do data mining, um, and so, you know, they've actually ramped up their, their enforcement. So if, if you're wondering how or why someone's doing it a certain way, this is, it, it's not a place to, in our opinion, take risks with your, your license or livelihood. So a couple of other state-specific considerations when structuring an ASC-OBL hybrid. Um, First, it's really important to note that some states just don't permit the hybrid model. Most do, but 
for, but some just don't. Um, and for those that do, temporal separation is key. Temporal separation means that before you start running your ASC as an OBL or your OBL as an ASC, assuming you're in the same suite number, you have to make sure that your patients are completely out of the recovery room in the facility before using the space for the opposite, um, the op opposite type of use. Um, in addition to temporal separation, it's really important to ensure that there's separation of medical records, that access to EMR systems is separated, that access to drug use by one provider um, and administration is locked up, that your drug cabinets are locked up. Um, really, these are entirely separate entities and they should be treated as such. And the other thing to keep in mind is your clients, I'm sorry, your, your patients need to know where they're being treated. Uh, are they being treated in an ASC? Are they being treated in an OBL? Signage is really important to, to have in the waiting room to, you know, because patients' co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance can be drastically different if they're being treated in an ASC versus an OPL setting. And there have been instances out there of upset patients who would go to a state consumer agency and file a fraud report um, because they feel as though they've been misled somehow by, you know, a lack of signage, et cetera. So that's just something else to keep in mind. Uh, it's also incredibly important to know that states are ramping up their regulation of OBLs due to some bad actors uh, in various states, in various industries. You know, there's been some uh, Brazilian butt lifts in Florida that have caused, you know, Florida, Florida legislation and, you know, have caused Florida to uh, enact new rules around OBLs. There's been, you know, there's been and continues to be some potentially bad press out there. So I think as a general trend, we'll see OBLs under increasing um, uh, licensure and increasing enforcement. So again, it's, it's important to know what the rules are regarding OBLs and also to keep an eye on the rules as they develop over time. Um, in addition, it's important to understand if there are certain restrictions on who can use an OBL, who can be an investor OBL under state laws, and whether or not some states allow different types of anesthesia or what type of anesthesia would be provided or you can provide in an OBL versus ASC setting. Some states only allow local anesthesia while in an OBL, while others may allow twilight or deeper sedation. So it's important to, to check the anesthesia rules before getting going with uh, providing services in OBL. Um, something else to mention is the MACs are taking notice of the increasing trend of OBL development. In November 2018, Novitas issued a proposed LCD preventing venous stenting in OBLs. Um, so, you know, MACs are increasingly looking at whether or not, you know, certain types of cases are uh, medically appropriate in an OBL setting, just like they've done in hospital outpatient departments and ASCs for years as an increasing number of cases are proposed <coughs> in these types of settings. So here's some of the business and legal takeaways. Uh, and it also covers maybe some common mistakes and issues that we've seen in developing an ASC or OBL hybrid. First, it's important to give thought up front to whether you may wish to sell the OBL later on. If so, then it's important to either organize the OBL as a separate standalone entity, but it's also important to remember that this structure can have certain disadvantages that I covered earlier. You may need longer lead time. There's a fair market value requirement to buy into a separate OBL. You may need new payer contracts. So those are you know, some of the considerations that may require more lead time. If you decide that you want to keep your OBL as part of your practice and you later want to roll out the OBL assets of the practice into a new legal entity, then oftentimes such a sale can result in a taxable transaction, although we've seen some accountants get creative and try to find ways to avoid or mitigate that tax impact. But it's important to think about that early on. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to complete legal and organizational and syndication documents before you spend money to build out a project. Uh, spending before syndicating places one, in our opinion, a position of negotiation weakness, since investors may perceive that you need them more than they need you. If you've got a building that's up but you 
don't have investors and they're waiting on you to make decisions um, or you're waiting on them to make decisions, you know, that can really draw out discussions and negotiations. It's also incredibly important to know just generally who's on board and willing to put up their share of the capital for a project before you start spending money. Um, don't build the Taj Mahal when you need a Marriott. Uh, remember that patients, you know, will typically follow you and your reputation. And yes, they may want to receive services in a nice facility, and that's important, but overbuilding your facility can reduce or altogether eliminate your profits. And you know, lastly, when you build your financial pro forma, it's important to consider whether state licensure anesthesia laws or Stark laws or other considerations could impact your pro forma. So it's important to work with a knowledgeable management company experienced at considering these types of issues um, accuracy in creating a pro forma is helpful to you as an investor, to others who you want to work with. The last thing that, that anyone wants or needs is to later on look back at the pro forma and say, how is this such a big miss? So, you know, as you're developing your financial pro forma of how the building, uh, I'm sorry, of how the business is going to look and develop and operate and perform financially over the next five years, it's important to work with, you know, with, with good folks who are thinking about these issues alongside you. Um, a couple of other considerations. If you're building an ASC and OBL hybrid model, try and have identical ownership between the ASC and OBL um, in terms of who your investors are. We found that it, when you have differences of ownership, it tends to create or can create some gamesmanship among whether patients are receiving services in an ASC or OBL setting are physicians making choices based upon where they may have a financial incentive versus where, uh, you know, the medical necessity or appropriateness of patients. So, you know, if you've got identical ownership, it tends to eliminate some of those quote-unquote cherry-picking concerns. And, you know, finally, keep in mind that non-competes are the glue that can hold these projects together. <coughs> of course, you want to create and ensure that your non-competes are lawful. Some states don't allow different types of non-competes. Other states have significant restrictions on making sure that they are, you know, narrowly drafted and narrowly crafted. Um, so again, it's important to, to know that those rules up front, but um, it's also important to know if, you're, if the folks who you want to partner with may have other adverse or competing interests before you uh, decide to partner with them. So with that, uh, We've got a few minutes left to open up the floor for questions. We really appreciate everyone joining us and taking time out of their busy days, and uh, we'll open it up. Okay, there are, we have a couple of really specific questions that we prefer just to have a conversation with the folks who are asking those um, individual questions. So we'll, we'll follow up with the, uh, with the questioner there, but I guess unless there are any other questions, we appreciate you joining us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Jan or Jake or myself. Thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, I'll answer one question, which is a you know a good one. I, someone asked, I still don't get what a hybrid is. So the the short answer to that is a hi a hybrid is a space or building that's being operated some days as an ASC and other days as an OBL. It's typically the same space. We, um, and so again, it's, it's referred to as a quote unquote hybrid because that space is used for two purposes. There are other types of arrangements where maybe you've got adjacent suites where one AS, where one suite is being operated as, as an ASC, the other suite is being operated as an OBL, and those spaces are being operated on a sole and exclusive basis. That's 
something like a hybrid. It's not exactly a hybrid, but you know, I think that's really just adjacent suites with, you know, slightly different purposes, even though, you know, many of the same discussion points uh, would apply here. But a, a true hybrid is where, you know, one suite or one space is being operated on different days for different purposes. But thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Jason and Jake. Thank you, Sam.